Well, happy Mother's Day, everyone. I know there were several greetings. Uh, we're reminded here it's May the 10th, and it's our delight to be together. And uh, we just honor moms, even part of the service today. The passage we're looking at is going to highlight uh, the character of mothers, as we like to do. And so the passage lends itself to that. So we rejoice that you're here with us together. And let's just begin our time. We'll open our hearts and our hands. Uh, open up your hands to the Lord and say, God, we receive you this day. We thank you so much for the chance to join together to talk about the things of God. Uh, we stir up within our own hearts and with one another to, to the love and good deeds which you've called us to. God, we receive from you. We ask by the power of Holy Spirit that you would come in and, and abide with us and that not just here but around the world, the gospel would go forth with power, the great news that Jesus is uh, in our lives and that he's coming again. And we just pray that you would use this morning to help uh, govern our hearts and lives. We begin with one voice united through those who are here with this grand prayer. You taught your disciples to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you so much for everyone. I just want to get to, to the right from the beginning. Uh, just a couple of things as the school year is coming to an end. Uh, they're doing something special for our high school graduates. Uh, we're not telling them what it is yet, but Jordan's going to be reaching out to you. And there's the number for the church, 452-8285. Uh, or she'll be emailing a few of you, I would assume. But if you'd like to help or participate with some of that, some of the things that she lays out, uh, what we have planned. Um, we found out from Bill Lynn Shirley that Juanita Cree Moss uh, passed away on Thursday. And a service is going to be held at a later date. Juanita uh, was an active member at Congo, and then she moved to North Carolina and then to Florida. And I, by God's grace, have been able to talk with Juanita, oh, I'm going to say three or four or five times over the last year. And, and really thanks to Bill and Lynn and they reconnecting us. Bill and Shirley played a great role in that. And um, Juanita's wanted to talk about the things of the Lord. My last conversation with her was about heaven and about uh, some questions that she had. So clearly, I think the Lord was preparing her, and it was exciting to talk with her and pray with her, and I know that uh, she is rejoicing. Hey, we are joining for prayer on Thursdays, uh, Thursday nights on Zoom at 7.30 in the evening. So um, just for half an hour, we've had uh, uh, seven or eight of us, nine of us maybe have joined in. So I encourage you to be a part of that. You can go uh, on the go. You can just listen in or we can pray something the Lord's laid on your heart. Uh, it's a great time to be called to prayer. A uh, reminder also to email, text, or call the office to add any update prayer requests for the publications and prayer chain. There is power in prayer and we're communicating that. Um, I would continue to say, just continue to remember Chris from Advantage Housing. As far as I know, last Thursday, he was still in a coma. He had had a fall. Uh, in, in uh, some of the work projects that they've been doing um, and uh, is still in a coma. So pray for this, Chris, uh, as a young family. So be praying. I do want to say thanks to you. Uh, the trustees met this last week and uh, on the Zoom conference to talk about some of the things that are going on with the housing. And it's gotten slowed down because, again, um, uh, but still moving forward. I just do want to thank everyone for their giving. In the month of April, we were back up to our normal pattern. Uh, we got a little bit behind in March. Uh, so <clears throat> um, just so you know, we're about, we're about 10,000 back from where we normally are at this time of year. Um, thankfully, uh, we, uh, the team there and, and uh, Buffy helping out with that, or, or we have a, some in the checkbook, so that's not a problem. But we just, as you think about giving, just send your uh, checks directly to the church. And Kevin is crossing, processing them. Uh, in the way that he normally would. So, hey, our students, thank the Lord, Kylan and Jordan are telling us they want to serve. They want to find ways to serve. So they really know in what ways can they help. So if there's something that uh, they could do to help you, uh, they're winding down school, they need to get outside and do something in the nice weather. So let the church office know, uh, Jordan and Kylan, they can mobilize there. 
And uh, so if there's anything that we can do, we want to help. If there's maybe a neighbor or something that you know has a need, doesn't have the, the resource, that's a good outreach. It's a way for us to show love uh, to those who are near us. And if we can accomplish that, uh, let's mobilize. So before I go on, Kylan, Jordan, uh, Kim, uh, anyone else, Stacy, uh, who has anything that we need to emphasize, please open your mic and tell us now. Yeah, John, I have a friend whose husband uh, is having open heart surgery Tuesday. They took him to get a cath, I think it was two days ago, down in Indy, and they kept him and told his wife she could not be there until, I don't know, five to seven days right. after. So nobody's going to be able to be with him. Sure. So what's your friend's first name? Monty. M-O-N-T-I. Let's pray for Monty, okay? We'll do it. Anything else? Nat announcements or prayer requests? All right. Well, let's keep moving. And as I mentioned, um, uh, we will kind of move through that service this morning. We want to accomplish that in a good way. So I want to start with this communion. We were talking early on about how uh, some of you were coming on, uh, how the Lord used this uh, time of communion to recenter each of us in our attention. Uh, it was one of those things that he did as the last together thing that he did with his people. They were uh, with his disciples. They gathered there in the upper room. John chapter 13 went on. They, they um, had that time. It was part of their what we have experienced a few years ago, a Seder supper. So it was a full meal. And then as part of that, there are actually uh, four cups to drink of in that. So when we think of the cup that we are part of, the cup that, that Jesus drank of was the third cup. It was the cup of suffering. And even this morning, as we're going to talk a little bit more about suffering, and Ellie and I were talking a little at breakfast, you know, suffering is part of the human experience. But for the Christian, suffering has a purpose and a sense to it. If you don't have the Lord, I think suffering can often get into in our minds that suffering is purposeless or what's the point? Or you hear begin to, you know, how would a good God allow for suffering? Well, here's the core. Because of sin that occurred in the world, everything suffers. In fact, in Romans, Paul goes on and says, does not even creation itself groan in anguish, right? Creation itself groans in the suffering of uh, the difficulties and hardship of life. Let me ask you, as you guys are out right now uh, getting your plants planted and some of you are putting the flowers in and going to put those in, which grows easier in your garden, plants that you nurture or weeds? <laughs> I think that's a pretty self-evident truth, right? I mean, weeds pop up everywhere and they grow easily. Plants require care, feeding, nurture. Some of you on the, uh, the other night were out covering up your plants. I was talking with a lady yesterday who had already set out her tomato plants, a bunch of them, and she said, I lost seven of them even though I had them covered up because of the frost. It was so cold. Well, I mean, so, so gentle plants, and remember this thought, need to care, but there is suffering that occurs, and there's a hardening that comes to plants because of suffering. Uh, again, for those of you, again, who are planting things, they have to go through some things, but they can only take so much. But you know what? When it comes to the weeds, boy, they live right through that being frozen, okay? The weeds in your life are only driven out by that which is difficult and hard. And that's really what the cross is about. The, the, the emphasis of the cross makes sense to the believer because it makes sense of suffering. It makes sense of suffering. So when you think of your list of suffering, and even my teaching this morning is going to begin with that, um, how do you make sense of it? it? It really, it is the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about that in explaining it to the church. And he was then saying, hey, when you come together, don't gorge yourself because they were having a full meal. But <clears throat> he came to the part of remembrance of this. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So even this theme of the book of Ephesians, or excuse me, Thessalonians, is this that he's coming. So inherent in Jesus saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. <clears throat> this is my suffering. And then in, in the passage also, it, when in each of the gospels, Jesus says, I will not drink it again or the fruit of the vine until the coming kingdom. So until Jesus comes back, he's not drinking any wine <laughs> because he said the next cup he drinks is the cup of victory. It's the final cup. And it is the cup that he's coming back to drink again, right, in the, in the end. And, and it's that fourth cup that we are still waiting for. So we wait even now. But in the meantime, we remember these elements. So uh, grab your elements, if you would, and, and then spray, just pray together this blessing over this together. Uh, Lord, we, we bless these elements. It's not about the element, Lord. It's about the picture. It's about the symbol. And so we received them from your hand this morning, reminding us that not only were you here, not only did you suffer, not only were you broken for our sins, but Lord, you are uh, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the one who is coming again. And so even as we take this time to participate, Lord, we ask that you would apply this symbolic truth to our souls. We don't understand the magnificence of it, but we receive it in your hand and we rejoice to know you as our Savior. We thank you, we love you, and we bless these elements in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and based upon his authority, his command, we obey. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So this is my body, the Lord Jesus says, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Or such a simple reminder, <clears throat> and we receive from you. We thank you that you are the one who works in our lives. You are the one who accomplishes what only the gospel can do. Even as we uh, participate in this element of the gospel, this reminder, this reminder of the good news, we can identify, Lord, with the suffering a little bit. There's not a person here listening this morning who hasn't gone through some suffering, as we often say, either in some suffering or Lord is about to experience some suffering. So Father, we ask for that one who's been through suffering. Maybe it's some grief. Maybe it's something that they're experiencing and that they um, are, are grieving. Maybe it's the gr broken relationship of a grief. Maybe it's a lost loved one. Lord, maybe it's uh, a job situation that they're struggling through. Maybe it's their work. Maybe it's the pressure that they have bearing ar around them that they're, uh, they're coming out of. We pray for the one who is going through. Pray for Monty, Jill's friend, who's going to have surgery this week. And there's a host of others, Lord, who are going through uh, upcoming uh, cancer uh, renewals, who currently are under um, ongoing treatments. Uh, we continue to hold a pillory in her treatments uh, for that she's uh, gone through. I'm glad she's here with us this morning, but we just ask for her. Lord, so there's going through physical suffering, but Lord, there's the emotional stress and pain and challenge. We know that this season, as Eric uh, uh, mentioned earlier, it's life sideways. It's, it's so counter to what we are understanding. So we, we, in the middle of our suffering, we 
just uh, we pray that we would keep it all in perspective and that your word would give us the solace and the solution. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray for that. And I pray for the person who may be going to experience some suffering. Lord, we don't want to borrow trouble. You tell us each day has enough trouble of its own. But Lord, uh, none of us know what the day may bring forth. So there could be and there will be some suffering for each of us yet. I pray that we would right now uh, in the sane moments or, 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 or try to gear up so that when the insane moments come, we are ready to respond with wisdom, with clarity, with understanding, with calmness, with a view and a character and a depth of soul that causes us <clears throat> to praise you in the midst of the storm. Once again, Lord, the passage we're going to look at, we're going to see what occurred and what, God, you do when we praise you anyway, when we trust you anyway, when we trust the Lord with all our heart. So, God, your people that are gathered here together in this place we ask that you would help each of us to receive from you. Lord, you are the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. You're the one that helps us know this truth and live it in a real way. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, the uh, worship band came together again and gave us uh, something to focus our attention. And so uh, I believe it was Cortland and Madison with some uh, help from Wendy playing and then uh, Chandler, I think that's all who were involved. So they uh, just listen in as they uh, we play the words or play the music and the words here for King of My Heart. I drink from, oh, he is my star, the king of my heart, be the shadow of my hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my star.
Thanks so much, band, and thanks for coming in and doing that work for us. And we're excited that, uh, to receive that. I mean, it is a great uh, reminder of what God has for us here this morning as well in First Thessalonians chapter 2. And we want to move right into that because it's that last phrase, when the night is holding on, right, it, God is still good. And night is coming, Jesus said when he was here, when no one can work. Let us behave as the children of light. In other words, if we have the light, it ought to take such a grip on our souls that it changes our perspective. We have to fight through that, though. We need to, 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 to discipline ourselves in the areas that we can discipline ourselves, because only God saves you and sanctifies you. He does that work. But as I was reading this Oswald Chambers this morning, for those of you that read My Utmost for His Highest, and I share those often, I hope you do, it, it, God gives us the habits of heart that we have to build to do with the light with what we have. We got to do something with it. And as a result, it's responding rightly to those difficulties. Well, we're going to see the disciples did. We're going to give you some background that showed uh, where these disciples or apostles came to this truth. But let me ask you a question uh, that you can answer among yourselves. I mean, has anybody been treated badly this week? I mean, how about somebody who, you know, maybe in your mind, somebody overlooked you, somebody maybe has forgotten about you, maybe you were out on the road and, you know, a little, uh, hadn't been driving lately and somebody honked at you or said something unkind or uh, anybody called you and verbally beat you up or said something behind your back that you heard about this week? Well, uh, and anybody had anybody just actual throw a physical stone at you this week? Well, I mean, I guess probably maybe we have experienced some difficulty and hardship, but most of us, it's outside of our normal realm of experience to receive uh, verbal threats, uh, to be backed into a corner, to have somebody physically throw something at you. So it's hard for us to enter into the fact that this is the environment that we find the, this letter uh, being written out of. I mean, see, in Thessalonians, we talked last week about chapter one, about this small group of believers who in three weeks were planted as a church. And then they took the responsibility for their own work of faith, their labor of love and their patience of hope. That's what we looked at last week. That their faith was at work, their love was laboring, and their hope was being patient. And they uh, bought in, and they were growing. They got the purpose and the plan of Jesus. They knew it was for them. They just didn't think, well, I can take or leave this truth, right? I mean, they were radically changed by the message that the Apostle Paul brought to Thessalonica. And they got beyond, oh, this is a nice Sunday platitude, or this is something that we do on Sundays. Listen, their whole lives were turned upside down. This whole idea that there is a risen Jesus for you and I, that he's worthy of our worship, and that we are calling, and we are called to serve him, and, and you are called to serve him with your whole life. Listen, you're not serving a cause or just an ideal you're serving and getting your will and, and, and into alignment with the creator of the universe who not only has a plan for the planets, but he has a plan for you. If God has a plan for little stars that function in the world, and he has a plan for little atoms and protons to build things and build the building blocks of life. If he has a plan for the universe and he has a plan for the micro, 
Isn't it reasonable to believe that God has a plan for you? He's got a plan for me. And that my joy and your joy is the joy of discovering. It's discovering his purpose and his plan for my existence. He knows why he created you and that you love him. You're listening this morning. My assumption is because you have some sense that God's on the move in your life and you're called to it. And I'm thankful that you're here. I hope that's why you're here. If you're, but this idea that this gospel had radically changed everything. It goes back to Acts chapter 16. So I'll get you to read it. I'm going to tell you quickly the story. So right before Paul had come to Thessalonica, he had been in Philippi. So what had happened in Philippi is they came in, they did what their pattern was. They went to the synagogue. They reasoned there among the Jews. Well, along the way away from the synagogue, there was a little demon possessed girl that came and did like the demons did to Jesus. And the demons shouted out the truth that these men are preaching the good news of, the, of Jesus and, and, and he is the son of God. So think about that for a second. That's a mind bender that the demon possessed little girl was championing and telling the good news. Well, the passage in Acts 16 says that this little girl followed them everywhere and was shouting this out. And it says Paul became so annoyed at the situation that he, he knew the little girl was demon possessed and he cast the demon out of the little girl. Now, the challenge was that, that she was calling out her own freedom because when the demon-possessed little girl was, was, had the demon cast out, the people who had been using her for advantage uh, and taking advantage and gaining money from her got upset. So here's what happens. They take them to the magistrates and say, hey, this person's upsetting our city. Well, he had uh, upset their money source by, by casting the demon out of the little girl who was championing the good news. Now, there's a, there's a whole passage. You got to go look at Acts 16. So I challenge you to do that. But here's what happened then. So, so they put him in jail. And that's the story where they're, they're, Paul and Silas are in jail and they're singing and worshiping God. Now, once again, a brain bender. Midnight, they're there together. They put him in the deepest part of the prison. They're in stocks. Uh, and, and, and they're there singing and worshiping God about midnight. And the passage says that an earthquake came and everything, the doors were flung open. So now they're ready to get, go free. And yet the, the jailer thinks that they're going to go through. And, and, and in that day and time, if you were a jailer and, you know, people got out, you died. So this guy goes, takes out his own sword and, and gets ready to kill himself. He's going to commit suicide because he knows he's going to die anyway. And Paul says, wait, don't do that. And, and, he, and he's so struck, he comes and kneels down and he, and he asks this powerful question in Acts 16. It's one we all have to ask at some point in our life. What must I do to be saved? Now, maybe he just meant in this moment, what must I do to be saved? But I think he had been listening to the hymns. He'd been listening to understand these guys. They were singing they were rejoicing, they were praising, and he knew that they were unlike any prisoners he'd ever had. Let me ask you a question. If you and I were prisoned for the good news of the gospel, would there be a difference noted between you and the prisoners in there? Well, that's powerful. It's something we ought to think about because, look, there may come a day when some of us are imprisoned for the gospel. It's happening around the world, and it will happen again. For your boldness to the things of God. It happened then in Jesus' time, and the Apostle Paul said to this young, this man, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And we know believe just simply as all of that, believe and receive the gospel. This simple message of the good news that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, what the, what the young people just sang about. And this good news message is what radically changes everything about you, your thinking, your actions, your attitudes, it must change us. And we have to continue to allow it to change. So there's this jailbreak. The prison, the prison guard takes him home. His whole household gets saved and they went ahead and got baptized in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this story is powerful. Well, the next morning, you know, the, 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 the magistrates heard about the jailbreak and said, you know, well, we'll you know, well, let's, but they also heard that Paul is a Roman citizen. 
Well, that changed everything because now they've beaten up a Roman citizen without a proper trial. And now they're in trouble. So they just wanted to cover it up. That's what governmental leaders do, just by the way. So they wanted to cover it up. <laughs> and, and Paul said, no, you're not covering it up. He said, I want, you know, I want a formal apology <laughs> and, and then a send off. Well, that's what they did. They came and apologized and, and, and said, hey, we're sorry and sent them on their way. It was from that experience that Paul shows up uh, in the travels to Thessalonica. So you can imagine he's telling the story. He's saying, look, this is the power of the gospel. This is the power of praise in a difficult situation. Because the good news of the gospel is what we're here to bring you. And this is the message. God is for real. He made a way for you. He died and rose again for you. And we are willing to suffer and die for this message. You see, that was clear to them. So Paul's telling them, what else do you need to know? Jesus is the answer. And what else are you going to live for? So this is where this passage begins here, where he's continuing on with verse 1. Here's what he says. You yourselves know, dear brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not a failure. Right? He was only there three weeks, remember? You know how badly we had been treated at Philippi just before we came to you and how much we suffered there. That was the story we just set up. Yet, our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. It's the first thing I want you to note this morning, and that is this. Good news. This good news that we're talking about is God's news. It's first of all, yet our God gave us. God gave us this message. God gave us this truth. God gave us this thing to set our souls free. My friends, listen, the greatest thing that your mind, your will, and your emotions need today, the greatest thing that your body needs is the fact that God is for real. He saved your soul. He saved you for eternity. And that good news should shape everything that you think about today. But Paul says, listen, not only is that good news for right here, but the good news is it's mobile. It is mobile. Boy, that's truly true. Years ago, when you think about it, did you ever think you'd have a mobile phone? <laughs> Some of you that had a bag phone years ago, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. You, that was the first mobile phone. It was a big case that you carried around bigger than a computer. It weighed five pounds. It was huge. Now, all of that is in the power of a mobile phone. And, and the amazing thing is that even these tools right now, and even though it's frustrating to worship on Zoom, I want you to think about uh, live church, uh, uh, live church, which is Craig Rochelle out of uh, Tulsa in Oklahoma City. They are currently the largest church in America, solid gospel preaching organization. Uh, Craig has uh, started that church back in the early 90s, and they uh, now normally of among 30 some campuses have uh, about 85,000 in attendance up until recently. They are also, if you guys use the YouVersion Bible app, their church created YouVersion Bible app. And, and, and so if you're using that, it's because of uh, Life Church, uh, or Life Church, I think it's called. But it, nonetheless, Craig Rochelle and his organization have done amazing things to do that. But you know that the mobility of the gospel, that during this season, that they had uh, on the second week and uh, after the COVID, they had 7 million people log on. 7 million people log on to their church services. Here's the great thing about what's occurring right now, my friends. Here's the great thing about how God is using and getting glory through what mankind in some form has messed up. We've got a disease that's impacting the world, and yet God is mobily communicating the good news of the gospel throughout the world in ways that are unparalleled in human history. That's good news. And it's mobile. It's moving. So while you may be stuck at home, your ability to influence through the tools that God has given you, your Facebook account, your social media applications, your Instagram accounts, your tools, God has said, how are you going to use them? Are you going to use them to mobilize the good news? Or are you going to use it to talk about, you know, what you had for supper or what you're going to do next week or where your pictures were? From? Nothing wrong with any of those things. Don't get me wrong. If you're posting those things, don't get upset with me. But I'm telling you, 
if you're doing all those things and yet we're not talking about the good news of what Jesus Christ is doing in our lives, we're missing the point of the mobility tools. Here's the challenge. The good news in this case was mobile. They were moving from the Philippian jail to Thessalonica and they got thrown out of that town too. You may come a time when you're not able to use your tools to communicate the gospel. Because if you radically are committed to the good news of the gospel, people will want to shut you up. They'll be sick of you already. Okay? So, so just expect it, right? And they'll be saying things like, is all you ever talk about is Jesus? What's wrong with you? Okay? Listen, my friends, if Jesus radically changes our life, we don't have any other message. We don't have any other news. The weather is not news. Okay? Good news is that you have eternal life and it's, it's opportunity. So our goal then is, Paul says, look, now take this good news, and it's mobile, but I want you to know something else about it, okay? That good news is, is accomplishing. It's pure. Paul said it comes from a pure heart. This is what he says in verse 3. So you can see we are not preaching with any deceit or impromotives or trickery, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with good news. In other words, this is stewardship. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone determines the motives of our heart. Never once did we try to win you with flattery, as you well know, and God is our witness, that we are not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. As for human praise, we've never sought it from you or anyone else. So what Paul says is, listen, I want you, first of all, to know that I've modeled the mobility of the gospel. That's in those first couple of verses. And now he said, I'm, I'm modeling for you the purity of the gospel. The gospel is not only the, on the move, but it's got to stay pure. It's got to stay simple. And notice, Paul gives us a list of things that go along with the purity of the gospel. It's almost like a checklist. He said, the, the gospel should go forward. And here's how you're going to know it's about a pure gospel. It has to have no deceit. That means it's not hypocritical. In other words, it, it doesn't say one thing and do another. That's deceitful as it relates to the gospel. It has to be a pure motive. In other words, the, the gospel can't be to gain personal advantage because of it. Mark well and wisely those that gain advantage through the gospel so that they're heaping onto themselves uh, their, their own benefit. They're leveraging church tools, the body of Christ, for their own purposes. It's like somebody who would come in, and again, we have business owners and people who we, we champion their business, but it would be like somebody who comes in and leverages the church for, to, 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 for their own business purpose. And thankfully, I'm thankful that we do have valid, good business owners, and we champion you and will cause you to grow in your business and your work life. But we don't use one another to do that, okay? We, we don't accomplish that. Well, Paul's saying you don't do that with the gospel. You don't pad your pockets as a result of that. And he said, that's our motive. Uh, and then he says, it's not about trickery. In other words, it's not, we're going to spring the gospel on you. You guys all have been, you know, in terms of invited to something where you weren't sure what quite the agenda was and somebody sprung on you something that they were uh, buying and selling. Nothing wrong with buying and selling, right? I mean, they, they, we need to do that. But hey, don't spring it on me. Tell me what we're doing and tell me what we're talking about and give me a chance. So give me your pitch. But don't use that to trick me into something. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Don't trick people into the gospel. Don't befriend people uh, out of that effort. Be, be upfront with, hey, I'm all about who Jesus is. Now, we can be wise. We don't have to be uh, pushy, uh, but we need to be wise in that. But re recognize here he's referring to the authority that God says you're entrusted to this as the stewards of this message with one goal. Remember, your goal is to please God, not people. He's the one who's the true measure of the motor. He said, we don't flatter people and we don't treat people in a way to get you to give us something, but we, we, we haven't done this with you. And Paul's saying, I'm not looking for a pat on the back about this. I'm clarifying for you what we have and haven't done. So here's the question for you and I, as we are carriers of the good news, we need to give ourselves this audit checklist. Okay. Are you treating people in your life as projects for the gospel, or are you really just loving them and letting the gospel come to them? Okay? Are, are you even thinking about the gospel as it relates to that? And you and I have to say, listen, we, we can't uh, just look, oh, okay, we got somebody who, who we can uh, get involved with their life and so to see if they have the good news or not. God's called us to love people where they are, who they are. 
right? And, and, and when we do that, we get a chance to talk with them about the greatest message, which is uh, the love of the Father. And that's what the good news does. The good news is mobile and it's pure, but then it's also nurturing. I alluded to this in a, even in our communion time. It's the next thing. The good news is nurturing. And this is where we're going to shout out to moms, right? Because it's a metaphor that he's using there. Verse seven, as apostles of Christ, we certainly had a right to make some demands of you. But instead, we were like children among you. Or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. We loved you so much that we share with you not only God's good news, but our own lives as well. Wow, this is a great passage. We honor you mothers today. Well, Paul gives a shout out to the heart and character of great moms. It's both an example of how we need to care for one another spiritually, and it's a tribute, a challenge to mothers to be these kind of women, right? I mean, ladies, I thank you, but also I challenge you. Here's the target. Here's the kind of moms that we need to be. I know there's moms out there who say, well, I haven't always been loving, and I haven't always been nurturing. I haven't always been caring, right? There's some moms who feel that weight today, or maybe you grew up in a home where that wasn't your experience with your mother, but this is the goal. This is what, what Paul's saying is, this is the kind of character that we need to have, and it's the right way to live the gospel. And he said, you have the authority to, to we have the authority to, to wade into that, right? But we don't demand it. Just like moms, here's the deal. Great moms don't demand respect with their words, right? There's not a mom who's going to demand her children give them a card today. Or demand their, that you know somebody say something nice about mom today. I hope. Okay, great moms don't demand respect with their words, but they command respect by their actions. Right? There will be some great moms who are championed today because of their caring and feeding actions, both literally and figuratively. And as a result, no matter the age of the person, young or old moms, you command respect, and I thank you. Because of how you have fed and cared for people for years, we thank you. You've shared it. You've laid your life on the line every day. You moms who work those 18-hour days, some of you working outside the home and then coming home and having the expectations of kids and, and husbands, I respect you. And it is your work that your hands of guidance your direction, your correction, your instruction, your involvement in our lives. We thank you. We praise you that you've shown us how to feed and spiritually care for people. So what Paul's saying is the way that you can imagine the best mom caring, the best mom serving, that's the way I want you to handle the good news of the gospel. That's the kind of care and feeding that you and I need to model ourselves after when it comes to the people God's placed in our lives. So the question is, hey, are you giving that kind of focused attention, the kind of focused attention that moms give to their children, to the people who are looking to you for spiritual leadership? There are people in your life who need to see the Lord. I don't know who they are, but somebody is watching your life and your behavior, and they want to know if the good news is impacting your life. And my question is, uh, you know, are you going to be like the great moms that were celebrated today? Are you going to be, am I going to be the kind of hands that serve like these moms who have served? Well, in light of that, there's a little video clip I want to show you that I think illustrates that. And I hope you'll see how it does that right now.
I'm not sure I can. Um, so, uh, hey, just wanted to say thanks so much to you moms and for all that you have done and, and what you have accomplished. Uh, for those of you moms who, who uh, are senior moms and you can identify with those hands, those aching hands that have served, we thank you. For those of you whose moms are gone and you look back today and you think, that is the kind of mother I had and there's some lot of things that I can remember and you saw her hands serve you, we thank you. And for those of you mo young moms who are in the middle of that uh, and who are uh, responsible and feel the pressure and the weight of that, we encourage you, be faithful, be the kind of mom uh, that you've seen modeled. And if you have a chance to thank the Lord only because your mom's not here today, I pray that you will. And if you have a th chance to put uh, your hands on your mom, <laughs> and thank her. I hope that you'll grab her by the hand today and say thank you. It's really, really, really important. Well, that's the heart of moms, and that's the heart of the care that we need to have. But here it goes on. Apostle Paul says, listen, this good news, it's going to require some extra effort. Watch what happens next. He says, don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day. We toil to earn a living so that we would not be a birth to any of you as we preach God's good news to you. You yourselves are our witnesses, and so is God, that we were devout and honest and faultless toward all of you believers. And you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children. Well, Paul continues to build on that image of mothers, and then he says, Hey, I'm still using the in, in image of a family. And he says, don't you remember my brothers and sisters? He said, we just talked about moms, but now we are brothers and sisters together. And we're together in one family for one central purpose. He's reminding people to serve up the good news. Remember, that's the whole theme of this. And look what he says. He says, night and day toil. He says, listen, you never get out from under the message of the gospel affecting you all the time. My brother and sisters, it ought to be the first thing we think about in the morning. It ought to be the last thing we think about in the night. It ought to be everything that we think about. I, I'm not saying what else you do. Those are all fine and good things. You need to have a normal balanced life that has the ebb and flow of eating and drinking and working and playing and relaxing. But everything should have the thread of the good news of the gospel through it. You can't think about the Lord Jesus enough. It needs to be the continuous part of our lives. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, we earned a living so that we wouldn't be a burden to you. See, in uh, Acts chapter 18, you can go find it there early on. Paul, it's the only time in the Bible that it talks about Paul making tents. So apparently Paul was a tent maker. As you can imagine, in a, a very nomadic type society, tents were important things. Uh, and people were still using them. And they were using them for structures. So Paul was uh, a tent maker. He was a, a sewer, seamstress, if you will. He's putting stuff together. And they, uh, in response to that, in, in Acts chapter 18, he came alongside Aquila and Priscilla. You'll need those, remember those names. And they were ones who were dear friends of the, him. They were helped him in his own faith. They were church, key church leaders, and they were tent makers just like Paul. And then it says he was reasoning in the synagogue. Synagogue. So his his plan would be to go into a town, serve among them. Throughout the week, he would be working, right? And and early on in, the, in this ministry life, then uh, he would uh, that was what would put bread on his table, and then he'd be reasoning in the synagogues until they threw him out, right? So it was a pretty simple life, but it was totally focused on what Paul was trying to do. He's saying, "Listen, Paul, you brothers and sisters." What he's telling him is, look, while he was called to this, Paul was not saying that there's professional Christians. Professional, he's saying, look, I've labored among you so that it would be a model for you of the kind of witnesses you and I need to be. You guys have heard me talk enough about, but I can't emphasize it enough, that listen, you Thessalonians are witnesses of devout and honest and blameless behavior. And as a result, look, you have a... a, a He's telling you, look, this has got to be the character and the purpose of our lives. And so in response to that, what he tells us then is, look, you've got to, to realize that this is how we treat 
the gospel, the good news, and this is how we treat and move forward. And then he closes it with this last thing I want you to see. He said, look, good news is our calling. The good news is our calling. Verse 12, we pleaded with you. That word pleaded with you simply, it, actually it's the word parakaleo. It's used in the first introduction of John chapter 14 and 16 when we're introduced to the Holy Spirit by Jesus. The, the paraclete, paraclete is the name of the Holy Spirit. And what Paul's saying here is he's using the same word. He said, we are parakaleoing with you. In other words, we're coming alongside of you like the Holy Spirit and we're pleading with you. We are making a call to you to make this personal. He's referring to these believers and he actually is telling them, we're, we're calling out to you to be this, this feel this weight and this pressure uh, that, that to come alongside, not you. But then he goes on, he says, we parakaleoed you. He said, and then we, we encouraged you. Encouragement has, again, not only just to come alongside, but also more of a coaching element. In other words, it, it, it means that you are called in such a way to, to comfort somebody, to correct their form, just like a coach would. It's the personal touch of uh, maybe not the screaming football coach, maybe not the coach on the sideline that's hollering, but the calmer coach that we've been introduced to uh, through guys like Tony Dungy and other people. That calmer coach that's coming alongside and nurturing and caring. And then he uses this word, he says, we pleaded with you, parakaleo, we encouraged you, we coached you, and we urged you. And this is a word that has to do with, it's a legal term that says we called you up as a witness. It's like uh, in a courtroom scene where the person saying, hey, we're calling you as a witness. We're urging you to come up. In other words, we're telling you, we're commanding you, you're going to come up and be a witness. And it's, it's actually used in the middle voice. And that point of the Greek in the middle voice means that there's personal responsibility engaged. So Paul's saying, look, we're calling you to come alongside of you. We're coaching you. And we're telling you that we're calling you out as a witness to, do, to what things, he's telling them, to live your lives in a way that God would consider worthy. Remember earlier in the passage, we talked about we live our lives to please God. We don't do it to be seen of one another. We can't be doing it to be seen of mankind. We can't be doing it for a pat on the back. We can't be doing it because, well, we want to be thought well of. Listen, my friends, any of those things are the wrong heart motivations. And Paul's telling them, look, this is the heart motive. We are calling you to live the good news. Why? For he calls you to share in his kingdom and his glory. My friends, listen, you have been called out of darkness and into the light. You have been called out of your night and into the glorious day. You have been called from your sin to a life of holiness. You and I have been called by the good news. We have to let it sink in so it can flow out. What Paul is trying to do is get these believers thinking in such a way that they get it so that what goes into the heart and the life shows up in their behavior. My friends, you and I are called to the same thing. This is our calling. Your life is your calling. And that's what I want to stop with today. Here's the question. Am I living God's good news? Am I living God's good news? See, good news is not something outside of me that happens, that I read in the newspaper. Good news is something that impacts me internally in such a way that living the good news is not optional. It's not a, oh, well, Jesus died on the cross and I hope I can do something nice for him someday. No. <laughs> Listen, Jesus died on the cross. He saved your soul. And your life and my life is to be centralized on one single purpose. No matter what you do to put bread on your table, it is the platform for your life and mine to speak and live the good news. For the good news is who you are. My friends, are you good news? Am I good news? When, when, and you, you have heard me say before, listen, when you show up at your workplace, when you show up to the people who you go to meetings with this week or Zoom talk to, when you show up as a salesperson or when you show up to serve uh, the table, to use your skill set, are you showing up as good news? 
is somebody coming in and when they see your face thinking, oh, thank the Lord they're here. My friends, listen, that ought to be what our goal is. That's the target. We ought to be the good news. The news that is known and read of all. The good news is who you are. May God help us to be this in the places he's called you to live and serve this week. God, I thank you for these people who've heard these truths from your hand. I pray, I pray that you would continue to mobilize the gospel, that we keep it pure, and that it would make a difference in the world in which we live. Lord, I ask that you would help us to know you, to trust you, and to walk with you so that the world may know Jesus lives and Jesus lives in me. All right. Well, God bless you. Hey, go out there and be blessed and be a blessing and share this truth with someone else.